大家好 ，Welcome to the Expresso Your Daily Shot of Chinese Words with Catherine Xiang. Catherine Xiang， 大家好，欢迎来到我的频道 The Expresso。我们在这个频道看字和词之间的关系，然后呢，也会分享一些历史的小知识和这个字和词的用法。So in this channel, we explore the relationship between Chinese characters and words. We also Tell you some fun historical facts about these characters or words and how to use them in a meaningful context. 一个今天呢是我们知识系列的一个小视频。So this video is part of the knowledge and insights series. 我们上一次呢说了关于这个汉字为什么非常的特别，非常的美。So last time we talked about why Chinese characters was the beauty about Chinese characters and how to learn them. And then I get a request、um, from the audience talking about Catherine. Can you expand a little bit more about the history and the calligraphy that you actually mentioned in your very first video? Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. 好的，没有问题。所以呢，今天我们就会更具体的来看一看这个中国的汉字的这个历史 history 历史。然后呢，我们也会看一看中国的书法。书法 calligraphy. So today I will talk a little bit more about the history of Chinese characters and also the five different styles of calligraphy. So hopefully by the end of the video you will know the story, the legend about Chinese characters, how it evolved, and also you can be able to distinguish five different styles of the calligraphy. Okay, are you ready? Let's go. Because of today's talk, I would like to share more understanding about Chinese characters in terms of its history, and we will also have a look at calligraphy in terms of the art form of Chinese characters. So let's start. First, let's talk about the history of Chinese characters. So that has a long history of five thousand years, and we can see. Here is a snapshot of how the Chinese character evolved from the very original record from the okra bones to the modern simplified Chinese characters nowadays. So here we have the very original form of the Chinese characters found, typically on the shell or animal bones, and kind of evolved through the history. And here we have the traditional Chinese characters still used in Hong Kong, Taiwan. And also Japan, and then obviously in mainland China, these are the Chinese characters being used. So no one really know about how the Chinese characters was invented. However, we do have a story about a legend. His name is Cang Jie. So this is a picture of Cang Jie, and you are right. You might notice the story was that he actually had. Four eyes. He's really good as he's really good at observing things around him, and he was a minister of the Yellow Emperor Huang Di. Huang Di was the first emperor according to Chinese mythology, and created the whole world and China. So he was at the time a minister of Huang Di and keeping record of all the events that happened in. The country. So, if someone's, you know, got some kind. So, if one village had a and in the old days there was no Chinese characters. So, the way they did at the time to record important events was to use a rope and tie a knot. Every time there is an important event, there will be. A knot tied, but with time, Cang Jie start to think, oh, I can't really remember which event is linked to that. So he had this idea. He wanted to understand what would be the best way to create a kind of a written version, a character to keep record of the things. So that was a seed in his mind. Until one day, so this is the story about how he actually. Invented the Chinese character, so that was on a winter day and really cold, and you can see the snow out there. And he went out hunting. So suddenly, he saw a wild bird passing through. 
got very excited, so we ran, chased after the bird and tried to catch the bird. And the bird ran away quickly, left a tray of the footprint of the bird on the snow and eventually disappeared. So he was disappointed because there's no dinner. He didn't manage to catch the bird, but he stared at the footprint and started thinking, okay, it's clear to me or any hunters, these belongs to the bird. It's not a rabbit, it's not a bear. So clearly if I do that, I draw and make a record of this particular symbol as the you know, foot or the feet print of the bird, we all know it's a bird. So this inspiration is really, really important. That opened the gate of the original pictographic because that is the idea of when you write something down, when you draw the symbol, people can understand that is the definition of that particular object. So this is the Chinese story about how the first Chinese character was invented by Cang Ji. So literally it's the hunting bird inspired him. So what we can find actually on historical record that was identified in Shang Dynasty, so about 1250 to 1050 BC, we discovered this Jia Gu Wen. So in Chinese it's Jia Gu Wen, shell and bone script on animal bones and shells, turtle shells in particular. And this script, we trace it back to Shang Dynasty and we discovered 5,000 in total. And among those, still we have 1,000 characters that we use nowadays. And the Chinese characters, the pictographic is the only hero, hieroglyphy, is the only hieroglyphy, is the only language that is still in use nowadays. And in Chinese, we call xiang xing wen zi. Xiang xing wen zi. So let's have a look at some examples of the Xiang Xing Wenzi. So this is the very original painting. So kind of you can see what is it? It's a goat, right? A goat, a sheep. So indeed nowadays, so this is the line of the evolution and this is the character we use nowadays for goat or sheep. Another example, this is a person, so you can see it's like a person in the ancient time bowing to show respect. So we have the evo evolution of the Chinese character of person till nowadays. So this is the current form we use. Pretty much all the characters we can trace them down and see the change from the very or original okra bone. And then this is the Zhang Guo, Zhang Guo, so the warring period, and then it evolved into Zhuan Wen, Lu Shu, and this is like coming through all the way Han, Tang, Qing, and then Kai Shu is the regular script now and the traditional form, and then after 1949, when People's Republic of China was founded, we now have the simplified version. So this character, you can see, I don't know whether you can uh, identify from the shape, that means the door, the gate. You can see it's like a gate opening. Uh, here is another example. This is the meaning of star, star in the sky. So again, we have the ev evolution of this particular character. Then with time, people notice, you know, just by the Xiang Xing, the picture, the pictographic, is not enough anymore. So we need more ideas. We need new method to create more concepts. The concepts may be a little bit more abstract. So that is later on, we have a new form of creating ideas. In Chinese, we say 指示, 指示, literally pointing at the matter. And in English, we call it, you know, indicative symbols or ideographies. 
So how does that look like? So I'll give you some examples. So this is the Chinese character for above or on. So you can see the very original form is something underneath and we've got something on the top. And then it evolve and then it become this character is as if you're pointing something up, right? So this is shang, it means above or on. Similarly, we have this character, which is xia. So you have something on the top and something underneath. And this is the character indicating something is underneath, below. And the final one, zhong, in the middle. So this is the original, something literally in the center. And then that evolved, and nowadays we can see this Chinese character still indicate the split, right? Indicate the shape. So that means center and in the middle. Very quickly, I'm going to show you three more characters and that belong to the indicative symbols and their numbers. So what numbers are these? Very easy, right? One, two, and three. Yes, indeed. One line, two line, and three lines indicate the numbers. Well done. Okay, so this is one approach, but then we have even more complicated and sophisticated approach, what we call xing shen zi. Xing shen zi. Xing means the shape. Okay, so that is the original shape, which is the meaning. In English, we call determinative. Shen the sound. So here, shen, the sound. So that is the pronunciation. So literally what you do is you have the meaning plus the sound. You combine it together and you create a new character. Just bear in mind here, the phonetic. So this character, qi, has its own meaning. However, in this character when it's compound, it does not give any meaning to the new character. All it does is to provide a sound. So here we have the water radical, water combined with qi sound, it means the river qi. And when it's jade combined with qi, we have a new character also called qi, but it means a valuable white stone. Same concept, wood, when wood combined with qi, that becomes Chinese chess. So if you play Chinese chess, you know it's made of wood pieces. And then we have the moon combined with qi, that referring to a period of time. Horse combined with qi also says qi, and that means a payable horse. And finally, that's another useful radical, what is the meaning of an omen, and that becomes qi means fortunate and lucky. And this is part of the reason why in Chinese you have so many characters that they look different. Here we have already you can see, including the original sound, we have seven different characters, that is qi, but they all mean different things, right? And it is the radical give the meaning to it. And this is one of very unique way of Chinese language to create more characters. And this is the reason when you start to learn Chinese characters, it's really, really important to remember what is the shape part. In Chinese, we call it bu shou, radicals. So here you have a chart of the common Chinese radicals, and each of them indeed contain a particular meaning. So we have seen uh, this one, the water, we've just seen that. We've also seen the wood right here. We've seen the moon here. So I'm going to show you just one more example here, the female, female radical. So one of the beauty of the Chinese characters, it does have indeed a very regular pattern and system. So the characters that I'm going to show you now, you might not know the meaning, you might not recognize them, particularly when you start to learn them for the first time. However, you can notice indeed each of them has the person, woman, the radical woman in it. And all these characters, funny enough, they all combine, they all fall into the category of the meaning plus sound. So this part gives the sound ma and then ma mother. So you can see all these characters have something to do with a woman. Okay, so 
when you start to learn Chinese characters, one of the most important thing is to start to recognize all of these different radicals because that help you to identify the possible meaning of the characters. And when you start to write Chinese characters, one thing to be familiar with is obviously the most smallest component of characters, they are strokes. So you can see here are the most common 21 Chinese strokes, and this is the full list of 31. Each of them actually have a name. So I think for, for you guys who are learning Chinese characters, you don't have to necessarily remember all the name, but you do remember, you do need to remember the shape and know how to write them. And here that gives you an indication of where the stroke will go in the character as an example. And the other thing to be aware of learning Chinese characters, particularly in terms of writing, is that Chinese characters follow a particular stroke order. So we don't write characters randomly. Again, there is a system to it. And the typical stroke order is, you know, horizontal first, then vertical, and then up and down, left, right, and inside first, then closure, okay? And so you have a range of rhythm or kind of uh, rules to follow. When we were in school, Chinese kids will be given this. So this is again something uh, not just you learn, Chinese kids learn as well. So this will be in a primary school in China when the Chinese children learn how to write characters stroke by stroke following the right order. And then nowadays we also have a lot of new application to help you to get to know the stroke order. I think one of the things to follow the stroke order, it helps you naturally to learn to write the characters better because it follow a very systematic way. And if you do not do that, maybe the characters that you presented is correct as a final form, but obviously you're not following the flow and it will actually make the learning much less coherent. Right, so we covered two different um, additional methodologies. One is the indicative, the other is the shape and the sound combination. So finally, I want to tell you there's even more ways that we create new concepts and ideas. And here there are typical three. So hui yi, zhuan zhu, and jia jie. So in English, associate compound, mutually interpretive symbols, and phonetic loan characters. So because of time, I'm going to focus on hui yi. That is one of the most common ways of combining new ideas. And similarly to the previous one that we use meaning plus sound, hui yi is a way of meaning plus meaning. So what do I mean by that? So let's have a look at some examples. So the first one I want to show you here, you have, if you remember, this is the person, this is the wood, the tree. So a person leaning against tree, what this person is doing is resting. So this is the example of the Chinese character. Xiu means to rest. And then when we cook the fish and we also cook the lamb, so we have the fish and sheep together, that means what? That must be really delicious. And usually in the old time, obviously you catch the food and you cook it straight away because there wasn't any refrigerators. So that indicated the food is also fresh. So when the fish combined with sheep, that is fresh and delicious. This is also interesting, the sun and the moon together. So these are the two things people, ancient people could observe, they're really, really bright, right? So when the sun and the moon together, it means bright. And then this character is in the, in the word Ming Tian, a bright day. What is that? That is tomorrow. So the new day, it is bright. It's gonna, the sun's gonna rising. So the final example, here we have woman, the woman radical, and then we have child. So when 
a mom is together with a child, that must be a good thing, right? So this is this character how means good. So it's giving the value and what people appreciate when mother can be together with a child. That is a good thing. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the history and the evolution of Chinese characters and different ways we combine and create new Chinese characters. Now let's have a look at calligraphy. A lot of you love calligraphy because you think they look beautiful. Indeed, I agree with you. And today for the talk today, I just really want you to be able to actually recognize five different styles of calligraphy and be able to differentiate and know a little bit about the characteristics of each style. So as I can show here in the cover, you probably can notice they are very different, right? So now let's take a look of each of them and see what are the unique features of each calligraphy style. So the very first one is called Zhuan Shu. Zhuan Shu, seal script. So this is the most ancient. So this is from the Warring Period and the Qing Dynasty, the first dynasty of China. That is the most closest to the okra bone style. And we can see the feature of this is they are relatively neat. Each character take the similar space. And also there's they're quite kind of lean and thin and a little bit curvy. Okay, there's relatively less like direct lines. And in a way, you know, the ending, which is quite unique, we can see the ending here of each character. They kind of almost like something is hanging there. Okay, so this thin look and the free hanging style, this is the feature of Zhuan Shu. Here we can see the same style written in a different form, which we will see here another form. You can see it's much longer and with the flowing ending. It's like a little tail, okay? You've got a little tail at the end of the characters. The next style in Chinese, we say Lu Shu. Lu Shu. So this also is one of the ancient style and evolved from Qing. But this is a style that is a lot heavier and chubbier almost, right? So we can see comparing to the previous style, it is much wider. So it's almost like the previous, previous one, if that was quite thin and tall person, now you have a kind of a, uh, a little bit shorter, but chubbier person. And the main shape, it's therefore more square. So you can see each individual character take a square, kind of more square shape. And it was a character that initially is from Qing Dynasty. And when it reached Han Dynasty, it became the most popular form, written form at the time. The next one, this style is so distinctive. I think you no, you won't be able to miss it. This is called Cao Shu. Cao Shu. In Chinese, Cao is like grass. So they grow everywhere. They're messy, right? So in Chinese, Cao Shu means the messy style. So it, the English translation, I think it's nicer cursive script. So you can see each stroke order is all linked. And there is this flow is very important is about the flow uh, and the, the, the kind of freedom to the character. And there's not so much emphasis anymore in terms of every single character needs to take the same space and follow the same rhythm. There isn't. And a lot of times also you can see different characters kind of taking slightly different shape, but also link together. So this particular style is evolved from the previous one, Lu Shu, but so it starts from, you know, Han, and then when it's in Tang Dynasty, it became really, really popular. And in Tang Dynasty, the, if the kind of uh, 
evolution of this Cao Shu, it became a pure art form. So people no longer then care about whether you can actually read the characters or not. So you can see here, this is the early version. You can still kind of figure out the characters. And when it moved to Tang Dynasty, it is almost impossible. I mean, even for Chinese native speakers nowadays, it becomes really hard to be able to read Cao Shu. Um, one of the other thing of Cao Shu is because it allow you to be so free, there's no emphasis on having to follow each unique stroke order. It just, you can write much faster, much quicker. So that is another feature of Cao Shu. Then we have the semi-cursive. So you can see here, we come back with the neatness. Okay, so there is this, again, the emphasis of the balance. And however, what is remaining is if you notice the characters, there's some kind of linkage. There's some kind of fluidity still remain within the characters, but they are much neater. So that's why it's called semi, but in Chinese, xing shu, xing shu means walking, walking script. So it is neat, but it still keep the flow. And Xing Shu is one of the most popular and most common um, writing style. Even nowadays, people will follow this one because it's not as crazy, like as messy as the previous one, but it's not as neat as the next one. I'm gonna show you what we call Kai Shu, a regular script. It allow you to save some time, but maintain this fluidity. So the last one is Kai Shu. So Kai Shu, now we call it regular script. But one of the features you can see is that indeed you can really see each individual stroke distinctively. There's no linkage. So the beauty of Kai Shu is extremely neat, extremely square. And regardless of the shape of the characters, you manage to demonstrate the stroke order really, really distinctively. And this is, um, what we call xiao kai, xiao kai, small kai. So small kai is the characters typically is less than three centimeters. So in in the range of one to three centimeters. So that's actually one of the hardest to write because despite the small size, you still need to indicate each stroke order really, really carefully and really, really clearly. So, so much for today's talk. I hope you really uh, enjoy the talk today where we talk about you know, you know, a little bit about the history, but also a little bit about the calligraphy as an art form. And I hope you will now be able to notice and distinguish the different style of Chinese calligraphy. Okay, see you. 好, 谢谢大家, Thanks everyone. Hope you've enjoyed today's content. And if you like it, give me a like and please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out more interesting or useful content to you. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave a message below and I will obviously take a look and I'm learning together with you and your feedback is always very welcomed. 好的,那么今天就到这里,谢谢大家,我们下次再见,再见!